Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. A special reason to give thanks, next on Wyoming Chronicle. Hello, I'm Richard Ager. Welcome to Wyoming Chronicle. When Americans celebrate Thanksgiving, you often hear the phrase, home for the holidays. But what if there was no home, no community to return to? What if you were alone in a strange land with few prospects of seeing your family again? Well, that's real life for millions of refugees around the world. And we'll talk about that in a few moments. But first, Chronicle producer Stephanie Smith brings us a story about a boy who survived for years in a world few of us can imagine, only to grow up, come to America, and find a new home in Wyoming. Okay, have a nice weekend, guys. Thank you for seeing you today. Stay away from the phone. It's my dad. America to me was New York City, was uh, the big buildings, because that's what I saw on TV. But the most important thing was this n lesson of the land of opportunities. Uh, that's what the definition of America is to Africans. Okay, democracy, democracy. Every day in a Campbell County High School classroom, there's a math teacher who offers discipline, okay, let's get going. but also the exchange of ideas okay, that go beyond the lesson plan. They walk in the, in the classroom and they're like, okay. Then they hear me speak and they're like, okay. Even have an accent, you know, which, you know. You know, it's like, Mr. B, uh, so where are you, if you, you know, where were you born? Well, I was born in a hospital and, you know, and you <laughs> get the giggle out of, out of them. And they want to, okay, where was the hospital? It was in the city. Which city? You know, and I'm like, okay. I know that, you know, I've got you hooked, you know, pretty well now. Because it's not only this student who asked that question, but oh, everybody now want to jump in and want to know Mark. more, you know. And I'm like, well, I'll tell you, but you have no, also to do something for me. You know, we are in here not about story, storytelling. I'll give you a specific day that you can ask me any question. <laughs> but these are the rules of the game. You're going to have to turn in your homework, you know. Good job. Bertine's good nature belies the tragedy of a childhood in Congo, interrupted by genocidal wars and rebel movements. I mean, it was literally watching a country moving in another country. Big, one of the biggest camp out there was about 500,000 people. Within the refugee camps and old tribal factions, militias began to form spreading revenge and war inside the Congo borders. Children were stolen to man these forces, and Bertine was one of them. The, the guy grabbed me and pushed me toward the door. Um, and my mom, you know, just jumped off, you know, the, the ground and, you know, superpose herself between me and the guys like you're not taking my son uh, unless if it's over my dead body and you know and you know she's crying and you know and um, then she you know this soldier looked um, at her and he's like, she's like he's like um, I don't have a dad I don't have a mom and um, we were told that, you know, bullets are cheap. Only a child, it was the last Bertine saw of his parents or siblings. Yeah. Today, grateful for he a new life, would work himself to the bone he finds ways to make a difference. Or complain about anything, so. The society we are living in, even in Gillette, there is a big gap between the have and have not. 
in Windows kid walking okay, a classroom you don't know which so, one are have and which ones have not okay I want to see work for the remaining of time right okay. you know one kid asked me and say I'm hungry and you know I had a yogurt and that kind of stuff and you know a pack of chips and just put it in, you know then he's like you know that you're my favorite teacher you know last time I ate was yesterday you know, and they say those things that you can easily brush off. But if you are paying attention enough, you're going to know I that there is an issue up there. No. Just go you know, it's a bargaining it's chip. Try and, try. and now, now that he yeah. can understand that I care enough about him, you know, right. mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing when I start I encouraging him to take the ACT test because he can go to college, not when I start showing him that, you know, I know I'm teaching you X and Y's, but this is a foundation for something greater down the road. Mm -hmm. He's going to really take it seriously and say, I need to pay extra attention up here. Mm -hmm. So I just try to utilize myself mm -hmm. to the best. You know, it's, so it's not only about teaching math, it's creating the relationships. And joining me in the studio are Bertine Bahij. And Susan Prichette, she is the co-director of the Center for International Human Rights Law and Advocacy. She's also a pro visiting professor of law at the University of Wyoming. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Well, Bertine, it's an extraordinary story from child soldier to teaching math in Gillette, Wyoming. But you're the one that we now know, and millions are displaced worldwide. Susan, I mean, what were the odds against Bertine ever making it this far? The odds of someone being designated as a refugee and then making it entirely through the resettlement process to end up here in the United States are a 1% chance of all refugees end up in Bertine's situation. Um, out of the millions of refugees in the world, there is a process by which the UNHCR, the United Nation High Commissioner for Refugees, determines whether or not any particular refugee should be returned to their country once it's safe for them to return, whether or not they should be integrated into the community in which they're currently living, yeah, or whether so, or not yeah, we'll get to they the should be resettled. In just mm -hmm. a moment, but you know, uh, did you ever think, Bertine, that uh, in terms of those kinds of odds, did you ever have any kind of notion of, of where you might eventually end up? To, to be honest with you, no. I never in the million years thought that I would be in the United States of America one day. Um, never dreamed about it. Um, so it, it came to me as a shock. And you know, when you are in that survival mode, you don't think far ahead. You know, all you're thinking about is now. And then as things start happening, you know, you don't get a chance to even grasp it because the process goes by. And, you know, before you know it, you find yourself in America and you're like, okay, where am I and how am I going to process this new home that I have now? And you know, so much of your experience obviously must have been just occupied in, in surviving, obviously, in difficult circumstances. And I think very few people, or too few perhaps, still understand that the use of child soldiers has been so much a part of modern warfare throughout the third world. Is this an African phenomenon or is it more widespread? The use of child soldiers is widespread throughout the world, although it often gets attributed to Africa. Um, and it's not limited to boy child soldiers. There are girl child soldiers as well. And um, even though there are international instruments that speak to the prohibition on the use of child soldiers, it's still a worldwide phenomenon. How long were you a, a captive part of the child soldier part I army? I spent uh, nearly two years under the control of the rebel movements. In, in your time there, did you witness any of your fellow child soldiers ever coming to seeing themselves as actually belonging uh, uh, to that army? Did they ever become willing participants? To a certain extent, yes, because uh, the system was set up in such a way that, uh, you know, even people in charge, people in command were, you know, young youngsters. And in order to, to gain that level of command, you have to prove to the people, you know, the so-called commanders that you have the ability, you know, to be 
uh, ruthless and you know and and follow the orders, whatever those orders were. And so there were people who actually took you know. What was there, was there one main thing that, that you would point to more than anything else that enabled you to survive that? Hope. I I just sincerely believe that deep inside me, although. I was young, I didn't understand it. I had this glimpse of hope that there was something out there for me. And that is something that I hold on and I still hold on until today. And we'll get to it in a little bit, but you are working in this field to talk about that. But Suzanne, you know, uh, boys were the ones forced to be child soldiers for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, how are girls treated? Girl child soldiers have the added dimension of facing gender-based violence in conflict settings as well. Not that boy soldiers aren't also targeted, but I would say girl soldiers bear the brunt of that and in terms of survival, enter in often to these um, marriages with combatants that they depend on then for their survival. You know, when you when you look back at your experience now, some some years away, and and I'm sure some of the studies and uh, that you've looked at in the broader issue involved with child soldiers, what would you look at or identify as the the longer term psychological effects of of going through that experience? Well, I believe you know it, it it's it wants you really deep, and you don't realize it, you know, because. It becomes like a second nature to you, you know. When you don't know anything other than what you're living, it becomes your new reality. The and new normal. Right? The new normal. So that is the new normal that you start carrying around. So how do you know to escape if it's normal? I mean, you must have retained something within yourself that said, no, this is not normal. Was well, it memories of the earlier childhood that you had? Yeah, and, 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 that, and that's the most important thing. Uh, uh, I grew up, you know, uh, I was born in a family of an educated, you know, educated parents and, you know, they always stressed out how education was important. You know, respect of self and others was important. So when I was put in this situation that was, you know, was going completely against those kind of beliefs, um, it made me question things. Uh, but yet I knew that I had to survive, you know, and accept my reality now. But at the same time, you know, I had this opportunity to be thinking about, okay, what could it have been should, if, if I was in a different situation? And that's why I had the hope that, you know, there had to be something better out there. Well, you know, um, Susan, the, the whole wider issue of refugees, mm -hmm. uh, some really shocking numbers when you look at it. But I, I read 43 million people forcibly displaced at the end of... 2011, mm -hmm. more than California. Right. I mean, make some sense out of those numbers because those are just <laughs> hard to grasp. It is. It's, it's, like I said, it's a worldwide phenomenon. Within that population, there are people who are considered internally displaced within their countries but away from their homes, and then there are people who've been forced outside of their countries, and they're more traditionally referred to as refugees. But the causes of these refugee flows um, stem from civil and um, internal domestic conflicts to international conflicts, and now we're facing a whole other generation of environmental refugees that are fleeing drought and food and water scarcity that are rivaling the numbers of refugees that have been displaced um, through violence and fighting. Now, uh, you've represented clients in immigration mm -hmm. cases, among other things. Uh, how, how difficult is it to actually win refugee status for, for somebody to gain entry to the United States? Like I said, it's very difficult um, for someone to be determined um, and and noted as a refugee by the UNHCR. That process is very difficult. And then to gain resettlement to the United States, only 1% of all refugees actually are resettled to the United States or a similar country. There's um, also a process of people coming here first and then applying for refugee status. And only about 30% of those cases are granted. Well, let me just read, if mm -hmm. I could. This is priority one right. uh, for classification as a refugee uh, to gain entry to the United States. And this is a quote, individuals with compelling persecution needs or those for whom no other durable solution exists. That sounds like an awful lot of people. 
It is, um, but the process has been defined as such that in order to even meet the defini definition of a refugee, you must show that you are going to be, you have been or will be persecuted on account of your race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. So that's a pretty narrow definition to begin with and then to for it to be determined that the only solution that fits your particular needs is resettlement in a third country is another hoop to jump through and so that's why the odds are so low. So when we look at those sort of qualifications, Bertine, uh, under which of those would would you have qualified when you when you got here? What what was the classification? Well, I, was it simply I, I, this, this, you know, being forced into service as a child soldier? I believe that's one of the elements, but mm -hmm. I also believe the fact that you know I lost you know contact with you know any family members was another issue, and the fact that my father was well known, you know, it could have attracted some uh, you know hardship should have been returned. Now you're from Bukavu in the Democratic yeah. uh, Republic of Congo. Was Bukavu itself? Uh, you know, disrupted. Well, you know, in, in the course of of the, the, the civil war, was you know, was was there no community essentially to return to? Yeah, it, it was. You know, it, it was disrupted, and you know, I'm not gonna go through the specifics because that's you know, completely different show mm -hmm. if we decide to talk about that. But the dynamics, you know, starting in 1994, you know, with the genocide in Rwanda, Rwanda yeah. and the you know the the city of Bukavu being right, you know, uh, uh, across the border from Rwanda, and that massive movement of refugees from Rwanda to to, uh, to the Democratic Republic of Congo, specifically in those border uh, border towns and Bukavu, when that's how, you know, everything kind of you know started, mm. and everything you know built up from from that perspective. I'm, I'm wondering at what point um, did you stop thinking of yourself as a refugee or or have you should I say? To be honest with you it, it's uh, a constant uh, fight in my mind um, because you find yourself in a position where uh, there's a contrast of where you are today and where you were you know, and there's this battle inside of identity, and you have to try to figure out the way to bring those two together. And it's a fight, I still fight every day. Uh, briefly, can you fill us in as to how things stand with uh, any hopes or chances of finding your siblings or, or family members? Well, I, there is hope out there. and. Uh, you know, I recently found out that, you know, out of my, my, my family, those uh, four existing siblings, you know, residing in the uh, refugee camp in Kampala, Uganda, and uh, with the help of the College of Law uh, from University of Wyoming and uh, um, Suzanne Pritchett, uh we've been, you know, looking at avenues out there that can help in the process. You know, I've discussed with, you know, various uh, uh, representatives um, mm -hmm. at the state as well as at the federal level and they've been really um, monumental. Well, you know, we just have a couple of minutes process. left uh, right now, but I, I'm wondering, you know, how do you regard uh, you know, Wyoming specifically as a place to come? You've obviously um, made a home here. Are we a welcoming country from your broader perspective? I think Wyoming has um, an interesting and unique perspective on immigration and the issue of refugees particularly. Wyoming is not a border state. We're not we're not being Montana. over Montana, <laughs> right? We're not being overwhelmed by an influx of immigrants and refugees, and I do believe that fosters a more open and welcoming attitude um, toward immigration in this state. Yeah, I would like to, to mention the fact that um, on the other side, uh, Wyoming is the only state uh, in the Union that has not had participate in the refugee res in our resettlement program through the, this organization called the ORR, uh, which is the Office of Refugees uh, Resettlement. Now, what would that participation mean, exactly? Well, uh, it means that at the uh, governor's office level, we uh, will need to have a uh, representative who is in close contact with the federal government and accept, you know, the, the, that you know 
Wyoming will be receiving refugees. Ah, so if you call our governor's office and ask for some advice on refugee matters, they may direct you somewhere else? Yeah, they will. Yeah, because officially we don't have refugees per se, and it's a process that I've been, you know, working on. Um, and uh, I've talked to one of my uh, county representative, um, Noreen uh, Kasperic, and we are putting together mm -hmm. legislations that we're going to present well, today. Uh, one minute left. So, what kind of difference do you think that kind of participation at a government level would make? I think it would make a huge difference. These resettlement programs are led um, by state government officials who indicate a willingness to receive refugees into the community. It, of course, takes an infrastructure to support newly arrived refugees to help them acclimate, give them a coat in the middle of winter, and any yeah. number of other well, support uh, measures. Thank you for that, Q. We got 30 <laughs> seconds left, and I got to ask you I don't think you get winters like this in Bukavu. No, not at all. <laughs> so, well, I'll now ask you what do you like best about Wyoming? I believe uh, Wyoming, my, the best thing I like about Wyoming is the feeling of being home. Uh, it, uh, we have small enough communities that you feel accepted. Everybody's interested in and trying to know who you are. That's going to be the last word just for now because this discussion will continue online at our website at wyomingpbs.org. So our thanks right now to Bertine Bahish and Professor Susan Prechette. And be sure to join us next time for Wyoming Chronicle. We close this program with another story of escape from oppression, but this one began here in America. On a hot July weekend, 200 people, mostly teenagers, began an arduous 30-mile trek across central Wyoming, a place of little water, fierce winds, and rough terrain. Few can travel through it, much less with a smile. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will show the show. What would draw thousands of young people every year to such a place? The simple answer, faith. And the desire of these young Mormons to pay tribute to the pioneers who went before them. And they come from all over the western United States, as far south as Texas and as far north as Canada. Electronics, cell phones and things like that, they just leave those at home and just come here to be pioneers. Since the Mormon Church began in 1830, its people have known persecution. Every place they tried to settle, they encountered trouble. Joseph Smith, founder of the church, wrote of their persecution in Missouri. We were again attacked by mobs. Many of our people were murdered in cold blood. The chastity of our women was violated, and we were forced to sign away our property at the point of the sword. 12 to 15,000 men, women, and children were driven from their own lands. Many more died in consequence of the cold and hardships they had to endure. Many wives were left widows and children were left orphans. The Mormons finally found safe haven, turning Illinois swampland into Nauvoo. For six years, they lived in peace, but eventually the attacks began again. Angry mobs burned the temple and killed Joseph Smith. Brigham Young becomes the new leader of the church but knows that it's time to move on. Leaving behind most of their worldly possessions, the journey began. Before it ended, some 70,000 Mormons would make the 1,300 mile trek to Salt Lake Valley. Uh, the exodus to Salt Lake in the, in the West was, <laughs> it was a tough time. I mean, you know, you, you think about moving that many people with ox teams and wagons and little kids, old people, the first Great Migration was difficult, but it cannot be compared to the later suffering of 3,000 poverty-stricken European immigrants. They could only afford handcarts to be pushed or pulled all the way to Salt Lake. Ignorant of the harsh conditions on the Wyoming High Plains, over 200 travelers froze to death. One woman, Elizabeth Jackson, wrote of losing her husband on the desolate Wyoming Trail. The snow lay several inches deep upon the ground. The night was bitterly cold. I sat down on a rock with one child in my lap and one on each side of me. In that condition, I remained until morning. Even without a winter blizzard, Rocky Ridge was the most difficult part of the trail. Facing heavy snow, frigid temperatures, and blowing winds, it took more than a day for the surviving pioneers to make this short climb and seek refuge from the storm. The story of husband and wife Jens and Elsie Nielsen is often retold and reenacted on the trail. 
And poor Jens, his feet were so badly frozen that he just finally said, I can't do this anymore, just lead me alongside the road. And Elsie said, no, I won't leave you. And she put him in the handcart and proceeded to carry him over Rocky Ridge and down the 15 miles into Rock Creek Hollow. She carried me up that hill today, but she's carried me throughout my life. <sighs> a lot of you young people out there, I hope that someday you're able to find someone who's going to be able to help you get through your life. There are many lessons along this trail. One is teaching young men about respect for women. There's a point on the trail where we divide the young men from the young women in order to remember how the men passed away or were unable to pull the handcarts anymore. And so the young men go up to the top of a hill and then the women pull the handcarts by themselves while the men are silently standing there watching. Uh, I've seen them stand there with, with tears in their eyes, wishing that they could help. Uh, it transforms them into a different time and a different feeling towards each other. I have pulled my handcart when I was so weak and weary from illness and lack of food that I could hardly put one foot ahead of the other. I have looked ahead and seen a patch of sand or a hill slope, and I have said I can only go that far, and there I must give up. But most of these pioneers did go on to reach Utah, and they would remember their time of testing as they crossed the unforgiving Wyoming landscape. For some, the lessons learned during that bleak interlude of time spent in the territory of Wyoming would help guide them the rest of their lives. I've gone on to that sand, and when I reached it, the cart began pushing me. I've looked back many times to see who was pushing my cart, but my eyes saw no one. I knew then that the angels of God were there. Was I sorry that I chose to come by handcart? No, neither then nor any minute of my life since. The price we paid to become acquainted with God was a privilege to pay.